This is Michael Woodward, and this is episode 233 of Jumble Think. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to Jumble Think, where we interview amazing entrepreneurs about their journey of turning dreams and ideas into reality. Along the way, we're going to share some tips on how you can turn your own dreams and ideas into reality too. Our guest on today's episode is Martin Dugard. More about Martin in a moment. Whether you are a new listener to JumbleThink or a longtime fan, if you haven't subscribed or caught all of our episodes, it's easy to do. Go to wherever you listen to podcasts. Simply search for JumbleThink Podcast. For those fans of Apple Podcasts or iTunes, it's easy. JumbleThink.com slash iTunes. And for Spotify, jumblethink.com slash Spotify. Now let's jump into today's episode. Hey there, welcome to JumbleThink. My name's Michael Woodward. I am your host. Super excited about today's guest, Martin Dugard. Before we get going, we want to thank our sponsors for today's episode, opportunityinchina.com and Penji. Penji is your unlimited graphic design service at a low monthly subscription. Head on over to Penji.com and use the code JUMBLE, J-U-M-B-L-E, to get 15% off your first month. We love using them. I think you will too. So head on over to Penji right now. Use that code JUMBLE to get 15% off your first month. We also want to thank our friends over at OpportunityInChina.com for sponsoring today's episode. They're doing great things, and whether you want to learn or teach abroad, they can help you find the right fit for you. Head on over to OpportunityInChina.com to learn more about what they are doing. And now let's jump into today's interview. I am super excited about today's guest. His name is Martin Dugard. He is a New York Times number one best-selling author and lifelong runner. He's written about running in endurance sports for more than 30 years and recently re-released his book, To Be a Runner, How Racing Up Mountains, Running with the Bulls, or Just Taking on a 5K Makes You a Better Person and the World a Better Place. Beyond writing about the world of running, he's also co-authored a ton of books with people like Bill O'Reilly, James Patterson, and Mark Burnett. Most well-known, he's co-authored the narrative nonfiction Killing Series with Bill O'Reilly. These works of history have sold more than 18 million copies. In addition, he is the head cross-country coach at J. Sierra Catholic High School in San Juan Capistrano, California. Let's jump into today's interview with Martin Dugard. Our guest today is Martin Dugard. Martin, thanks so much for being on. Oh, thanks for having me. Great to be here. I uh, love your book. I'm, I'm still working my way through it. I just got it a couple of days ago and uh, sitting here reading all of those. The book, of course, is To Be a Runner. You've been doing a lot of things and uh, writing for a lot of people on your own projects and for others. So tell us a little bit about your journey, your backstory into becoming a writer. Oh, sure. Um, well, it actually starts when I was I was very little. I went to my mom. I mean, I was just one of those geeks who loved to read all the time. And uh, I told my mom, I said, when I, you know, I was six years old at the time, and I said, when I grow up, I want to be a writer. Wow. And my mom told me, she said, well, don't be silly. Writers don't make any money. And so I completely you know, set that aside. And uh, so through most of my 20s, when I should have been going to college, I was spending a lot of my time at the beach just just reading and you know, kind of not sure what I wanted to do with my life. And then I finally graduated from college and I, uh, I got a corporate job. I was working in marketing for this firm and I just absolutely hated it. I had a cubicle and a you know, in a briefcase and a computer, and it just, I just hated it so much. And so I literally went to see a career counselor, and I took all these tests, and she said, uh, have you ever thought about becoming a writer? It seems <laughs> like that was what I was meant to be. Wow. So, yeah, so I mean, what I began doing is I, even the while I was still working for this, this large engineering company, um, which is, I was such a square peg in a round hole, uh, I would write in the mornings before work, and I would write uh, at lunch, and I began by doing small magazine pieces, and I kind of worked my way up the magazine food chain, and then one day, uh, out of the blue, I got a call from a guy named Mark Burnett, who's now a, a big-time TV producer, but at the time, he had no money whatsoever, and he asked me to come to Madagascar <coughs> to, to, excuse me, to write a uh, an article about an adventure race he was competing in, 
and I went and I got time off from work to go do it and uh, it was the best three weeks of my life up to that point and I wondered how I could ever go back to the cubicle world after such an amazing experience in Madagascar um, when I need not have worried that my first day back at work my, my boss fired me so from so that was February 24th 1994 ever since then uh, I have been a full-time writer 25 years yep it's crazy. I was just reading your post. Uh, you, you wrote a post. You have this cool little blog type thing. You call it the the Paper Kenyon. Uh, and you wrote a, a piece called Freelance, which talks about all of that that initial story of, of Mark calling you and you stepping into that adventure. It wasn't an easy step, though. You uh, In this story, you talk about having fear of even talking to your wife about it, knowing that you wanted on this bench, uh, to go on this adventure, but it was not the safe path. It wasn't the choice that people would call sane or normal or right. Tell us a little bit about that process of saying, maybe it is worth taking the risk. Well, you have to remember that... Um you know, we had we had two kids at the time, two very young children, and we you know we live in a world that discourages risk taking. And even though it was kind of cool that I was doing writing on the side, in addition to my day job, we had some very real bills to pay. You know, we had a mortgage, we had car payments, and and we were just barely making it. So, um, for me to suggest to her that I put all of that in danger. Um, by flying halfway around the world to cover an adventure race that really, it was kind of like being a grown-up Peter Pan. It was basically, <laughs> you know, it was, it did, for me at the time, it just kind of felt like I was being irresponsible, even though it was the thing I wanted to do with all my heart. And so, and I, I could tell because it terrified me. The thought of going just completely terrified me. Um, but at the same time, it just enchanted me. And, um, and my, my wife could tell. She, you know, after a while, she pinpointed me. She said, you know, something's on your mind. There's something you're not telling me. What's going on? And I kind of, I told her, I said, you know, I've been invited to, to go to Madagascar. All expenses paid. I'm going to spend three weeks in the wilderness. You know, there are going to be crocodiles and sharks and, uh, you know, complete risk taking and danger the whole time and she said you know you're not going to get that phone call twice you got to go yeah so she's a wonderful woman yeah I, and and i love that in in that piece you were writing you're saying you know that that call would come multiple times after that it's almost like when you step into the purpose and you were created to live in or or the giftings that you have all of a sudden when you choose to take that first step other opportunities open up for you is that been your experience that once you take that risk, you continue to see new opportunities unfold that take you deeper into that dream, into that that purpose that you're finding? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, when it, at that point in my life, and you probably read that in the blog post. I mean, when I was, gosh, I was that was 1993, so at the time, so I was 32 years old, and gosh, everybody around me at work, were, you, all of, they talk about it, you know, as they went to lunch was all the things they were going to do when they retired. Wow. And w when you're that age and all these people in retirement used to be 65, it was kind of set in stone. Well, that was 33 years away and I didn't want to wait 33 years to do the stuff I wanted to do. I wanted to, my dreams were to see the world. I wanted to have these great adventures. I wanted to, I wanted to write a book, just one book, <laughs> <I've written, laughs> you know, a bunch since. Um, but okay, since since accepting that invitation from Mark uh, Burnett to go to Madagascar in 1993, um, well, I've done everything. I want to yeah. pause you there because people hear Mark Burnett and they go, Survivor, The Voice, and all of this stuff, and massive uh, media uh, hero in, in creation. But that's not who he was when you took the risk. He, he was selling T-shirts, what, on Venice Beach or something? He was. And he, here's the thing, too. And if the magazine world is very there's a there's a certain procedure to getting a magazine assignment so the writer will pitch the story idea and it used to be that you would actually send a, a letter with clips this is before email so it was a very involved process but when mark called me he had literally arranged magazine assignments for me with a bunch of different magazines he had called and pitched it he's such a good salesman wow. so he told me he goes i've already called all these places you know outside runners world blah 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 and they want to do the story and you're the writer i've already attached you and i thought he was full of it you know so <laughs> i literally called these editors they go no yeah you got the assignment and it was the it's i've never heard of that done before or since wow um 
And you know, Mark is still in my life. He's he's got this new Eco Challenge remake coming up, and he called me like three days ago and asked if I wanted to be a part of that as well. So, uh, you know, I'm all in. You know, we'll, we'll see where that adventure takes us. That's so cool. All right, since then you've uh, written tons of books. Well, a few books that are your own, and you've written tons of books that have been collaborations. Uh, you've written with. Uh, James Patterson, you've written a lot with Bill O'Reilly on his Killing series. Tell us a little bit about that process of of now you've just been let go from your job. You come back from this massive adventure, which I'm sure you were just on like the the highest of highs when it comes back to now I'm facing the real world again. How did you make that tr- transition to say, I've just lost my job. I've just come off this adventure. Now I've got to really step up to the plate and make this thing work. Because it was you were providing for your family, your wife, uh, her dream was to stay at home. So it, it's resting on you. How did you make that transition? What were the steps you took? You know what? I, I took advantage of every single assignment that came my way. I didn't turn anything down. So, I mean, I stayed in magazines up until 1998 when I wrote my first book on my own. And I kind of, you know, you know, worked my way up to writing for the Sports Illustrated and the Esquires and the GQs. But I took every assignment, as long as it was not, you know, ethically, you know, off the charts. And there was, I never, which, which never happened. So I, I took everything that came my way. I mean, um, I flew around the world on the Concord for one assignment. I, wow. um, I travel, I've literally traveled to every continent except uh, Antarctica. I mean, I just, a bunch of different, like, like you said before, once you open that door and you start opening yourself up to these things and you've got the talent, you've got the determination, you, you know, you have to, you have to take it to its its limit because you know, like when my wife agreed after I got fired <laughs> that I wouldn't look, that I would not look for another job. I mean, I, I came home, I, I had some job interviews, and I was just I just couldn't face the idea of going back to the cubicle world. And she said, "If she goes, I believe in you. If you want to be a writer, you're all in. You, you make it work. Don't don't be looking at one ads. Don't be looking for other jobs. Make it as a writer." And so I, I was kind of beholden to that, um, to that challenge, and I still am to this day. I mean, I just I, that's what gets me up in the morning is this this woman who believed in me and who basically said, "You you have what it takes to to do that to to fulfill your dreams." And you know, along the way, I mean, she's taken a ton of crap from people who said things that I'm sure that a lot of entrepreneurs, spouses, and partners here, like you know, how can you let him chase his dreams? How can you let him, you know? put the family at risk. Um, and nothing can be further from the truth. I think people that stay in the same static job all the time and don't take risks and don't challenge themselves to to at least try, they're the ones who are putting their everything at risk. They're putting their health at risk, their their happiness at risk, uh, their family at risk. I think you you got to get out there and, and do something bold, and that's, that's what I've done. Yeah, I, I forget the quote, but it's somebody at some point said something that uh, – the worst life is one that you're dead while you're alive, basically, to, to paraphrase yeah, I get, that. I get and, that. And, and w- I hear it so many times from friends and family members, like, one day when I retire, then I'll be able to travel. One day when I retire, I'll be able to start that dream business I've always wanted to do. What would you tell them right now if they're listening about weighing the risk versus stepping into the potential? I would say, you know, start doing it now. You don't have to go whole hog. You don't have to, you know, quit your job now, but start at least going in that direction. I mean, you know, for instance, when I wanted to make the leap from magazines into books, it's it was like I was cheating on my, my day job kind of because, <laughs> you know, magazines were the bread and butter and books, of course, I was just writing it on spec. And so I just wrote a page a day just one page a day. And, you know, that kind of snowballed after about six or eight months, I had what could have been a book. Um, But, you you know, if if you just do a little bit every day, it's going to get you in that direction. I mean, I didn't, when I left my corporate job, I mean, I'd been freelancing on the side for five years by then. So I was, I was so determined to make it as a writer that even though I was working in marketing, what people said, what do you do for a living? I would say, oh, I do this, but I'm also a writer. And what will happen is, especially if you have a dream like that and you want to do something that that makes people kind of chuckle or laugh or kind of say something snarky behind your back, 
you've got you've got to develop a tough skin. You've mm -hmm. got to believe in, enough in your own dreams that, I mean, look, let's face it. When I told people that I was a writer back when I was just writing fifty word pieces for triathlon magazines for no nothing but a byline, to me it was very valid. I was a writer. I was writing stories that were getting published, even though they were only like eight sentences. But to other people, it was like, oh, that's so cute. He's he's a writer. Isn't that cute? Isn't yeah. that isn't that clever? Yeah. And you you've got to learn how to withstand that. Yeah, I completely understand what you're saying there from the standpoint of our adventure into podcasting and now being on radio nationwide with our show. It, it, it's been this journey where people are like, oh, that's a nice hobby. And you're like, no, this is what I'm building to sustain <laughs> yeah, right. my family and do as a business. It's more than that. We're, we're all in. And, and I think that that's one of the things I'm learning more and more. I've been an entrepreneur for 13 years now with running a web agency, which marketing, I have to agree with you, is not a fun place to live at all. Uh, it sucks the life out of you. But <laughs> that that whole concept of all in uh, seems to be the defining point for a lot of people transitioning from one day or from uh, hopes and dreams and into action. So how does that change of mindset to say, I'm all in and this is how I'm going to do it? You're, you, you were talking about how your wife was like, you know what? Don't keep going on the interviews. If you're going to be a writer, be a writer. So how did that change your mindset when you said, I'm all in? And how did that ripple through everything else you were doing in creating this as a business? It, you know, it, it really galvanized me because, A, the fact that I had people who were dependent upon me and something that could be seen as fanciful or uh, a lark. Uh, instead, they were treating it very seriously. They were treating it as seriously as I do. And at the same time, uh, my wife recognized that I would be completely miserable doing anything else. I, I firmly believe that I would either be dead or morbidly obese and chain smoking and probably an <laughs> alcoholic if I stayed in that corporate job because I was just so unhappy. And I saw people that that had happened to them. But it, but it became a challenge. You know, when somebody says, we are dependent upon you, you are going to find the money somehow to fuel this new career of yours, and you're also going to take care of us at the same time. That is a huge undertaking. But at the same time, if you love what you do, that is not something that feels impossible. It feels like, yes, I can do this, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to do it. And that's exactly what I did. Like I said, I took every assignment that came along. And when I got burned out in writing magazine stories, I determined to find a way to make it in the book world. And, you know, Mark Burnett, kept, we kind of kept rendezvousing, rendezvousing every few years. You know, like in 2000, he called me out of the blue and he said, I'm doing this new TV show. It's going to be on an island with 16 people and we're going to vote somebody out every three days. It's going to be like William Golding's Lord of the Flies. And I said, Mark, that is the stupidest idea for a TV show. No one's going to watch that. But, you know, uh, they, you know, there was a there was a book deal. You know, I was going to write the, the behind the scenes book, and uh, I said, I'll t here, "Here's the deal: I will go do your stupid show, but you need to send me uh, half the money up front for this book, and send me a plane ticket, and I need it by Monday because the show is starting. It was going to shoot like later that week. They get they called me in at the last minute, um, so the check arrived, the uh, the plane ticket arrived, and there I was off to Survivor. But again, that's once you open yourself up to stuff like that. You know, people don't get called out of the blue to go write the Survivor book unless they've actually, you know, put that boat into the current, so to speak. And you're, you're part of that that scene and you have worked for it and you've challenged yourself to to be in the mix or stuff like that. I, I think that's so powerful because many people want to do something. They want to be the next great speaker. They want to be the next great author, but they, they never take time to go speak at the small things or write the articles that most people will never see. And they don't do the time. How do people even make that first step to say, hey, you know what? I want to be that writer. I want to be that speaker. I want to be that entrepreneur, whatever space it is, to say, what is the small thing I can do right now that gets me in the water so that I'm floating with all the other ships that can help me take take the journey that I need to go on? Well, I think you said it best when you said that, you know, if they want to be a speaker, they should do those small speaking engagements. You know, and I've done a few of those just, you know, once you start writing and you get a violin, people every now and then ask you to come to speak to like the Chamber of Commerce or, you know, the Rotary or something like that. And you, but you learn speaking skills. You learn, it's, 
I think a lot of people are very fanciful. They they want to become a writer, so they imagine they're going to write a screenplay and sell it their first effort out the gate for a million bucks. Yeah. Or they or they're going to start getting, you know, fifty thousand dollar a gig speaking engagements with first class, you know, airfare and, and accommodations that go into it, not knowing that you've got to do the grind. You've got to build a word of mouth reputation, and you know if you're not a famous personality who can use their fame in some other field to move into speaking or some other field, you've got to build your own reputation in that. That takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of determination. It takes a lot of um, denying yourself other things. Maybe you have to get up earlier in the morning. Maybe you have to, um, do, you know, work through the weekends. Maybe you have to learn how to channel your energies in such a way that you still find balance in your life, but at the same time, you're all in with whatever this new dream of yours in fulfilling that dream. I, uh, I, I been reading your book about running, which we're going to talk a little bit more in segment two about that. One of the stories you tell, talk about is, uh, you did a screenplay for a movie that's been created. Um, and you talk about in the book, the, was it new Orleans, uh, syndrome or something uh, like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. And how, how, uh, we'll get into what that is in a second, but, Often when we think about success, here you are, you've written this thing, you're on the set, it's going to be a major movie, uh, and yet you are having to uh, push harder, go deeper, and there's still uncertainty even in the success. So talk to us a little bit about that and what New Orleans uh, is, syndrome or whatever. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Well, I'll, I'll kind of start at the back end. So after my wife and I first got married, we decided that before we got corporate jobs, we were going to drive around the country, just treat ourselves to, you know, it had been three months since our honeymoon. We thought we'd just do a proper road trip as a couple before we kind of settled down and did, did life. So, cause we, yeah, again, we were at that point where we thought, okay, this is, we're going to get jobs and then we're not going to be able to do fun stuff for a really long time. Um, and so we have to do this road trip now because nothing else is going to happen. Mm. And, and I should add too that once you step outside that mold and you and you choose to take some risks, I feel like every day I, there's some something new and cool that I get to do, and I don't have to wait to do stuff. And I've gotten, you know, I just get these these adventures come all the way, but only that's only if you get all in. Anyway, so I really I love to drive, but I'm a very aggressive driver. But on that particular road trip, I kind of overdid it as far as the daily mileage. <laughs> and by the time we got from LA to New Orleans we had we've been on the road for about four or five days and I, I just collapsed we I, we got there and I just I didn't even see New Orleans I, I stayed in the hotel room and slept the whole time because I was so completely exhausted and I find that with really big projects whether it's a, a book or a film or anything that's all-encompassing I think that we're able to push ourselves through the process, you know, you know, disregarding uh, our exhaustion or the fact that we're emotionally and physically spent, but it, I think at the end of that, the body demands that, you know, that it gets its downtime. And I've yeah. seen that happen so many. I've had so many times where I've finished a project, and all of a sudden I felt great doing the project, but the minute it's complete, I just I can't move. I just yeah. I just need to call it a day. Wow. But the, the, that movie itself, though, that was. You know, that was another example, kind of like that, that move from magazines into books and then books into film. I had just, just for fun, I wrote a screenplay about lacrosse. My son was a high school lacrosse player at the time. And uh, we, my agent put it out, and some of the studios are interested in buying the script. And they wanted to turn the character of a lacrosse player, who was loosely based on my own son, into, uh, into a, a soccer player, an inner city soccer player. And it just it just didn't work. So I thought what I would do, very foolishly, is that I would make it myself. Wow. <laughs> and, I, and so I, I lined up the money. You know, again, Mark Burnett was in the picture for that as well. Um, and I just, you know, I found a director. Next thing you know, we had cast the movie. And I showed up one day at, at the set, um, which had been arranged by the, our new produ production team. And there were there was a catering truck, and there were people doing makeup, and there were people doing lighting. It's like holy shit, we're we're making a movie. Yeah. Uh, and then you realize halfway through the movie that you're, the money's running out, <laughs> or <laughs> you're fighting with the director about a scene. Um, you know, and the the set for a lot of our stuff was seventy miles from my house, 
and I'd have to drive up there and spend 12 hours on the set. We wouldn't get done until 2 or 3 in the morning. Then I'd drive back home. But then I start taking calls again, you know, at six or seven in the morning about and yet another problem that had arisen that day. And it was a great learning experience. It was an exhausting, energizing learning experience. So we finally got the movie made. But at the same time, you know, once again, I got to the end of it. I just I just needed a call today and just shut down for a while just to regather my energy. Wow. So, so cool. As we wrap up this first segment, we always ask the final three questions. How do you find purpose in what you do? Uh, focus. I, I really try to do everything with purpose. I, every morning I get up and I get a legal pad out and I write down what my goals are for the day. And I, Anything that is extraneous to what I'm trying to really focus and accomplishment, uh, you know, focus and accomplish, uh, I either cross that off the list or move it to a secondary list. But everything has a if I'm writing a book, I'm writing a book. If I'm coaching my, my distance runners, I, I coach at a local high school. I'm, I'm coaching, you know, focusing on the goals for that. But everything is done with purpose. What is one challenge you're currently working to overcome in your own life or own business? Uh, I'm a very, uh, I, I don't want to say ADHD. I think that term is overused. But uh, sometimes, again, that in that search for purpose, I, I can let myself be bombarded by 15 different ideas and currently you know as the this killing series with bill o'reilly comes to an end and i'm looking for next steps about what i'm going to do next uh i'm really casting the net wide to see do i want to stay in traditional publishing do i want to kind of move more into a, a publishing slash television model and as i do that i've got to really focus my thoughts and kind of keep a tighter rein on what i do so that i'm not just just throwing ideas out there but i'm really trying to find ideas that that will lead to logical next steps what is the next big goal you have for your business? Um, I feel like with the success of the Killing Books, it brought my name, name recognition and uh, my level as a writer to a whole, you know, to, I don't want to say fame, but just this name recognition. And what I want to do is I, instead of at the age of 57 saying, okay, that was the high point of my career. I want to take it up another notch, a whole another notch. So for the next 15 to 20 years, I want to go to a whole new level where when people look back in 15 or 20 years, they look back at where I am now and they go, oh, that was just a stepping stone to this next level. We will be right back with Martin and we're going to go deeper into this conversation and uh, talk about his book that he just re-released on paper book called To Be a Runner. <laughs> There is a lot going on at JumbleThink, and we want to connect with you. Head on over to JumbleThink.com to learn more about Idea Camps. Idea Camps are three-day events that are going to help you turn those dreams and ideas into actionable steps to make them a reality. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're doing our first one in October of 2019. You need to sign up. It's our lowest pricing that you're ever going to find. So head on over to JumbleThink.com slash Idea Camps to learn more about Idea Camps and how we can help you turn those dreams and ideas into into reality. Today's show is sponsored by our friends over at OpportunityInChina.com and Penji. Here is a little bit more from our friends over in Opportunity in China. Have you been looking for a way to change your career social prospects? Do you see the world around you changing and haven't quite figured out what path you should take? You are not alone in seeking opportunity. Visit OpportunityInChina.com for access to scholarships to attend university in China. Or, if you have a bachelor's degree already, OpportunityInChina.com provides access to jobs in the educational sector all across China. Now, working in China is not only often well-paid, but it will place you among one-fifth of the world's population, boosting your social network, bringing you more deeply into the story of globalization, and opening up doors you never knew existed. Seize your opportunity now. Visit their website for more information at OpportunityInChina.com. We also want to thank our friends over at Penji for sponsoring today's episode. Penji helps startups, agencies, and marketing teams achieve more with unlimited graphic design support at one flat monthly rate. Their easy-to-use online platform pairs you with a professional designer and lets you create as many design projects as you want. Think of it as your monthly subscription to top-notch design. No contracts, no hourly billing, just fast, simple, and affordable design for all. Simply use the code JUMBLE, J-U-M-B-L-E, to get 15% off your first month at Penji. 
Now let's jump back into our conversation with Martin Dugard. We are back with Martin Dugard. And uh, before we get going, you've got some great resources on your website. You have amazing books, both collaborative books you've written, but also your own books. Uh, y- you need to let us know. How can we find you? How can we connect with you? How can we check out what you've written? Sure. Well, my website is martindugard.com, just all one big word. And then also you can find me on Twitter at, at Martin J. Dugard and on Instagram at Martin underscore Dugard. So it's pretty simple. I'm out there. I'm not, not too much creativity when it comes to all those handles. If you're on Peloton, my, my handle is Mowgli9, M-O-W-G-L-I-9. So for anybody who has a Peloton bike. Nice. I will be putting all those links in episode notes. You can find that at jumblethink.com. And then just look for today's episode uh, and you'll find all of those links there. Definitely check it out. I've been loving the Paper Kenyon. Where did that name come from, by the way? Uh, I ripped it off from George Plimpton. If you remember back in the 1960s, George Plimpton was a very successful Sports Illustrated writer. And he went and played quarterback for the Detroit Lions for one, I think just a training camp or maybe into the season. But um, And he named his book The Paper Lion. And years ago when I was covering the Tour de France and I was – also, you know, writing a lot about running. Uh, I wanted to kind of have a name for my blog, and so I, I kind of stole that. So the, instead of the paper lion, the paper Kenyon, just because the Kenyans are such uh, fantastic runners. They are, for sure. All right, we're going to talk about your book. It is called To Be a Runner, How Running Up Mountains, Running with Bulls, or Just Taking on a 5K Makes You a Better Person and the World a Better Place. I've read a lot of running books. I've read books from Meb Kefleski, who has been a guest and is going to be coming back on. We've I've read books from Dina Castor, read Born to Run, which is the famous uh, book about reading or running um, in the the uh, with the tribal people. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the the famous Runner's World uh, book, Running Less, Run Faster. But what I find fascinating about your book is that it is kind of the hybrid of some great lessons about running, but also stories and essays about how running's impacted you. Tell us about what inspired this book for you. Um, well, you know, I've been, I've been a runner since I was six and I've kind of been through all the phases of running and, you know, I've stepped away from it for two or three years at a time in my life, but I always come back to it. So, um, I've been a competitive runner in high school. I was all state as a high school distance runner. Uh, I ran competitively in college in, in uh, cross country and in track and field. Um, since I graduated from college, I've you know done marathons and triathlons and two week adventure races and all sorts of stuff. And ultimately, starting in 2005, I actually became a coach. I coach a high school distance team. You know, we're, we've had six state championships, so wow. I've kind of incorporated all of you know, all I've learned in my years is, is a competitive runner into this. And, and I'm, I'm not a competitive runner anymore. I, my, my really best days as a runner is when I just go out and run on the trails and take it slow and just enjoy it. But at the same time, in about 2000, I want to say 2008, um, I was ghostwriting a, the, the publishing industry had completely cratered because of, of the, the, the great uh, recession there. And, so I was ghostwriting a, a biography of a, a very lonely billionaire, and and so he would fly me and, and his entire staff to the Bahamas or London, so that we I could work on the book. You know, I could interview him in between his business stuff or his golf outings and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, but it was kind of like I was like the the hired servant writer guy, and I had a lot of downtime and. You know, all of my books prior to that had been, I did one book about the Tour de France back when I was covering the tour, but everything else had been history. And I wanted to write something. Again, I had all this downtime and I thought, well, you know, I've got some, I've got a little bit of time here. Uh, maybe I could write something about running. And I thought about all the running stuff and I didn't want to do a big, long running narrative, but I thought I'd, I'd just like write little essays about the stuff that I loved about running or the things I had learned through running. And, you know, as I kind of say in the, in the, in the, in the prologue for this book, I literally wrote the entire book, you know, soup to nuts, uh, printed it out, tied a red ribbon around it and FedExed the entire manuscript to my agent 
And I said, look, if you if you like this, let's go out and try to sell it. If you think it sucks, just we'll never speak of this again. Yeah. Yeah. And he liked it, and he liked it enough to sell it, and it went to originally to Rodale Books, who who were, was publishing uh, Runner's World at the time. So it kind of felt like a nice bit of synergy. And what we have now is that book came out in 2008. The hardcover came out. This is a paperback re-release of that book, but I've not only added six new essays, I've also taken the table of contents and really kind of restructured the whole thing. I've moved essays around. I've reconfigured everything. So it tells more of a complete narrative. A lot of people don't get the whole essay thing because essays kind of jump around from thought to thought. This is more of a continuous, fluid narrative and i actually think this version of the book is better than the hardcover that came out in 2011 yeah i'm really enjoying it for sure i have dabbled in the long distance run uh as a runner and short distances which kind of running do you enjoy best oh i just i like the long run i mean i'm I'm, you know i'm not a you know my long run anymore isn't 15 miles but my long run is still it's a good hour hour to 90 minutes a week um, and, and again, I, I live 500 meters from a trailhead. So from my front door, once I get down onto the trail, if I go, if I turn to my right, I go down to the Pacific ocean, which is about 10 miles away. Or if I turn to the left, I can go, I can wind through a very pristine wilderness up to the top of Saddleback mountain, which is about 16 miles. And again, I don't go all the way, but at the same time, I have the access to these trails and I just like to go out and wander. And it really is a great way to clear my head and, uh, you know, I don't want to be one of those people who really gets overt about it, but there's a, a spiritual component to it. Yes, you know, you yeah. get out there for a while, you can feel it. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm one of those guys that I just don't do the group run very well. I loved it when I was in college and we go, me and a bunch of guys would go screw around and just run and, <laughs> you know, but these days when I go out, I just very much like the solitude. I find that I'm enjoying life best when I'm running. I haven't been running for a while. I need to get back into it. You say in the book, uh, you were talking about coming from the symphony and going out to a running store. And uh, you write this, it was just the whole mood, which was this running is mundane. Running is assembly line. Running can be boiled down to a business. You need to know this about me. Running saved my life. For you, uh, you've talked about in the book, at least to the point where I'm at it, in it, that uh, you were, uh, there have been seasons in which you left being a person who engages with running and your life got worse. You gained weight or uh, it was after tragedy and you were in a season of grief from the loss of your siblings. Uh, Tell us a little bit about why running is such an integrated part of your life. You know, I think the greater question is why I would I would leave it behind at a time that you would think that I would need it more. Oh, that's really good. I, yeah, yeah. I think I think the first time was when I was in my early twenties and I, and I had finished competitive running in college, and there really wasn't much of a post collegiate scene at the time, so I didn't see much need for it. It's because up until then, running had just been a form of competition for me, and without the without racing, you know, what, why bother keep running? And so then, you know, I did what a lot of people do. I just, I just partied hard, uh, enjoyed life down at the beach. <laughs> and next, next thing you know, I, I gained a bunch of weight. And uh, the, the real tipping point was when there was a local 5K coming up, and I mentioned to somebody that, hey, might be run, he might be good to run a 5K. And they looked at me and they said, what you? You think you could run a 5K? Wow. So no, I, I used to run in college, and they thought I was lying to him because I clearly did not look like a runner. So that was the first time I came back. The second time. Uh, my sister died too young, and my my brother uh, took his own life. And so, uh, you know, it just it's, it it just paralyzes you. You know, it just it just everything kind of came to a dead halt. And and again, you'll you'll see in the book the process of where I kind of came back. All of a sudden, you look in the mirror. You say, you know, life goes on, and what are the things I need to do to continue this progression into being the best version of me I can be. And one of those things is not sitting there and just sitting in my office hour after hour, just writing and researching. There's more to life. I need to get out. I need to be physical again. I need to be the athlete that lives inside me. And uh, so, and then, and then the third time it happened is it's, I'm going through it right now. I, I had knee surgery a few years ago and the doctor suggested, well, you shouldn't run anymore after this. 
you know, I took his word for it. And then it's like, man, I, I don't like the mountain bike as much as I thought I was going to. And I sure hate the, <laughs> and I sure hate the pool. <laughs> so, and so right now, I mean, literally as we speak, this, this guy who's been running for 51 years is in, I'm, again, I, I, I spend three hours a day coaching high school athletes six days a week, um, 44 weeks a year. I'm to the point now where I'm having to relearn the whole process of what it is like to be a runner. And it's, it's hard. It sucks a lot of days. I, I go places where people can't see me run because I'm so damn slow right now. But at the same time, I am a better person for doing that and, and getting, getting, getting back on the horse. One of my other favorite quotes from the book, uh, you said, base miles, whatever wilderness you're wandering through will give you the strength and confidence to find a way out. Now, for those who aren't uh, runners, they may not understand base miles, that term, but this both seems metaphorical and also literal in that the literal case of running, having those base miles, those core miles under your belt, uh, help you get through the wilderness seasons. But going deeper into the, the philosophical view of life, the foundation of what we live also gives us that roadmap to find a way out. So tell us a little bit about that and how, whether it's running or different seasons, where you found those base miles to help you through those seasons of, of wilderness and wandering and of, of, you know, desert seasons where things aren't going right or things are falling apart. That's good. Uh, you know, Winston Churchill had a great quote is that, uh, when you find yourself walking through hell, keep walking. Mm, and, yes. and I love that because, I mean, I th we all go through seasons of life where everything is not hunky dory. And, and I, I know there are people out there who live these static controlled lives where nothing ever seems to interfere with the tranquil bubble within which they live. But my life is not like that. I, <laughs> you know, I, I'm a professional writer. It is a, it is a job of feast and famine. It is a job that involves engaging your emotions in a very authentic way every single day. I mean, because if, if you're writing stuff that does not ring true, if you haven't let yourself go to that really deep place to put those true words on the page, the reader will know right away that you are embellishing or that you're being surfacy. And so you have to go, you have to go deep every day. And sometimes it, it can be a little bit overwhelming. And uh, sometimes the tendency is not to focus on physical fitness, you know, or even something as simple as going for a run just not even not even for physical fitness just to just to be out of the office just to be on a trail someplace to to experience something other than work um sometimes it's easy just to focus on the work and, and not let yourself do those things and, and especially when you're trying to shut out emotions uh if you experience the death uh, of a loved one or if um you know maybe a project isn't going the way you want it to go sometimes it's easier just to kind of wallow and do nothing yeah. when, when, when actually the best thing to do is, is to move, is to get out there and do something that even if you're going really slow, even if you feel like uh, you're the worst athlete in the history of the world, as long as you're putting one foot in front of the other and you're doing something, it, it shakes things up. And I can't explain it, but just the, the, the blood pumping, the oxygenation of, of your brain, all those things, affect very much the creative process they affect your mood as he is an individual and it it makes it all worthwhile but again i mean i i, I work in a job that sometimes i'm very excited sometimes i'm very angry or 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 anxious mm -hmm. and running is the best the best medication i can think of for that Running is one of those sports that uh, we don't have a lot of gizmos and gadgets. I mean, we have our sports running watches to measure our distance and our time and pace. We have shoes, but it's not like cyclists or some of the other sports out there. Still have to ask, what kind of shoes are you running in right now? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, gosh, I was a gel Kyoto, a six gel Kyoto for 20 years. Um, but now I still wear them, but I don't run in them. I run in Hoka's right now. Oh, okay. Just, yeah, just because they're good for my knees. I, I will say this. I don't love Hoka's for – you can't go super fast in Hoka's. And I know they have their own competitive running team. But their their midsole is so cushy. It just kind of absorbs so much energy. I know it's good for the joints. I know it's good for the knees. And if I want to be a lifelong runner, I need to pay attention to those things. But uh, 
it's not it's not a fast shoe. It's just a shoe for you know for getting out there and doing it. Yeah, I tried the Hoka ones and I just couldn't do it. So I went back to uh, my Canvaras and my uh, Zero shoes and things like that. But I wanted to like them. I just couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. If I could, if I could find, I know, I know, Asics is trying to come up with something that's a little bit more gel cushion. You know, there's four foot rear foot gel in the Kayano. So I think they're getting there. You know, it's a, it's a, for me, it's a better shoe. I mean, I, I hope I can get back to that. I want to pivot here and talk a little bit about the business of writing. You've written, of course, magazines. You've written for Esquire, Outside, Sports Illustrated, GQ. You've written for Runner's World. And uh, you've written for a lot of places. You've also written books. You've written your books, uh, which are great. You've written uh, the books with Bill O'Reilly. Talk to us a little bit about the difference of writing articles versus writing your own books around your own passions and interests versus writing in a collaborative setting? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'll start with articles. When you, when you write for a magazine, and I think you'd have to be at the highest level of writer to, to escape this, but every magazine has its own voice. And you know, for instance, Outside Magazine has a very definitive voice, and a lot of the writers that spring out from outside, if you read their stuff, their, their actual books, they they write in a very outside sort of way. Um, Runner's World less so, but everyone kind of has their own boilerplate of how they want their magazine to sound. And so very often when you write an article for a magazine, it, the the editor actually just rewrites it. And you know, and you you do it back and forth. Well, they'll say like do this, do this, but at the end of the day, they'll insert enough of themselves writing as the magazine to make sure it sounds very uniform to what the magazine is doing. And it can be, you know, if you're a creative person, it can be a little frustrating. The money is not bad, but at the same time, it's, you know, I think everyone wants their voice to be heard. If you're in a creative profession, you want to be heard as, as a, an author, which is why when you write books, it's great. If you write a book, um, you finish the book, you turn it in, the editor looks at it, and they come back with their own editorial comments, but the thing is, when you write a book, the editor asks permission to make changes to the manuscript, or oh, they wow. will su they, or they will suggest things. They will say, "Hey, what do you think about moving this to here? What do you think about taking this out?" And you say uh, yes, or you say no. And it's a fantastic feeling because you feel like this if a really good editor is actually making your work better because they can see things you can't see. And when you're working very closely together, it is so uh, enriching because all of a sudden you read it, you go, "Oh, why didn't I see that first? This person is a genius," and it's <laughs> it's an amazing feeling when you when you and I've had I've worked with some great editors. I mean, I've worked with some of the best in the business, and these people have all made my books better. Wow. Um, and then uh, the collaboration thing, I didn't ever think I would become a, the per, sort who collaborated. I mean, I mean, I'm a very much an introverted solitary individual um in the first couple times i did it was strictly for money it's it's an easy payday so i wrote a couple books with mark burnett and um i think my name is not on a couple of them but but you know they're mark's books and, and i was the guy who wrote them and then uh, in my most of my own books are about history or exploration and so when james patterson wanted to do his first non-fiction book uh, he uh, reached out to my agent, and uh, so I went to work with, with Jim. Super cool, good dude. Um, he basically gives you an outline. It says, this is the topic. This, These are the chapters. Um, you know, deliver me a book within a year and a half, and wow. that's, that's, that's child's play. I mean, I, I write – I can do a book, and I've done books in like 40 days, but – so – that was that was really fun. And we had a lot we had a lot of fun back and, and there's a lot of travel. I mean, the murder of King Tut involved, you know, going to London to research at, at the British Museum. It involved going to the Valley of the Kings. So a lot of fun with that. Um, and then that led me to when Bill O'Reilly wanted to start doing a history series, and he'd he'd been doing nothing but political stuff until then. Um, uh, it was it made a profound difference in my life when he selected me to write to co-write the Killing series, because we've got. We have such a, a unique uh, collaboration thing, and I, I almost think that everybody who collaborates should do it just the way we do it. Okay. Because we, um, you know, what happens is I research the topic, I write 
what I think the chapter should look like. And I send the entire thing to Bill. He rewrites it in his own voice. Then we get on the phone and we combine our two versions and we chop and we edit and we add and and then we you know we just do it chapter by chapter. And so we're on the phone. We get we do about two chapters a week. We're on the phone. Um, so I live in South Orange County, California. Bill lives in in Long Island, and we we've met in person maybe a half dozen times, but we're on the phone all this time. And you know, and we never talk politics. It's always history, and there's always this this ideal of making the best book possible, which is it's super fluid. We both do our own jam, and when we get together, we make it better. And it was interesting because I, I I learned the value of this about a year ago. I was asked um, to go in and do a touch up on a book by a very successful person who I cannot name. Um, but I flew to Las Vegas and I, I thought we were going to sit down together to kind of fix what was wrong with his book. And instead it was, I walked into this suite where there were like an army of 10 people who were all his employees who were also going to help rewrite the book. <laughs> and, and, and we sat there and it was like writing by committee. Oh my goodness. And, and at one point, they said, "Hey, let's. It's time for dinner." And I thought, "All right, let's go. We're going to leave this this hellhole and go get some food." Instead, they had an enormous tray of corn dogs brought up, and uh, green slushies were served for. And I thought, "I'm just getting. I'm getting out of here." So, oh I, I, I've never. I literally, I've never walked away from a project. But I, it, I said the next day, "I said, look, I am not the writer for you. You need. You got your people." It's all good, and so I just I walked away from the project. I'd never I've never done that before or since. Bill O'Reilly is a very polarizing figure right now, and his his killing series is vastly different than his political stuff. Obviously, there's a different purpose for that. What's one thing about Bill O'Reilly that you wish people would know? Uh, without a doubt, it's loyalty. Wow, he he is incredibly incredibly loyal. He's very very generous, you know. Um, but he's incredibly loyal. He, um, you know, it just basically every time there has been someone attacking our books for any reason, Bill, Bill takes it. And if somebody attacks me personally, Bill has my back every time. And, um, I I know Bill's a a polarizing guy. I think that's part of being Bill O'Reilly is you want to be polarizing. Like, I mean, obviously I can't speak for Bill, but he is, he's (laughs) <laughs> it's, it's like, like people just don't know like i'm around bill he's very funny he's very warm-hearted very loyal um and it's just uh he's a great guy to work with and he is a great storyteller it really makes a difference he really has a good eye for story remind people again how they can find and connect with you sure so i'm at uh, martindugard.com that's my website and my webmaster the goddess nikki is reminding me that i need to do another blog post so i'll put something up in the next couple of days um on the blog if you if you go to the website i have a newsletter you can sign up for the newsletter i think you have to scroll all the way down but there is a way to sign up for the newsletter and i send just a monthly little little thing out there and it's it's a lot of fun i just talk about various things going on and uh, maybe with a couple links to this and that and you can also find me on Twitter at, at Martin Dugard. I think it's Martin underscore Dugard and uh, Facebook at uh, just Martin Dugard. There's an author page. I'm not as good on the Facebook author page, but I'm really big on Twitter at, um, at Martin J. Dugard. We'll be right back to do rapid fire questions. We would love to be friends with you. Head on over to jumblethink.com. You'll find links to our Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Let's be friends and do this journey of dreaming big and turning those dreams and ideas into reality together. So head on over. Let's connect. Now let's jump into rapid fire questions with Martin Dugard. We are back with Martin. We're going to do rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Bring it. Bring it. Okay. All right. My wife wanted me to ask you this. You've done a lot of adventure. You've done a lot of research to prepare for the books that you've written. Where's your favorite place to go and why? London, without a doubt, because London has everything. You know, like Samuel Johnson once said, if you're bored of London, you're bored of life. Um, so you get the British Museum, you get the British Library, uh, you got the Parliamentary Archives in the House of Parliament, you've got Windsor Castle. Um, there are just so many historical monuments that you, you just kind of stumble upon. So when it, I, I make it a point to go to London for research at least twice a year. What is one tip you give someone with a big idea or dream and they don't know where to start? I would figure out what you want to do. I mean, it's, I mean, what is that dream? It, it, it has to be 
everything has a, a starting point. I mean, so you know where you want to be, but it's start small. You have to start at the at the very bottom of it to find out what are the. You know, Margaret Thatcher once said, "Figure out what you want to do, and write the ten steps it's going to take to get you there." What is one big lie about entrepreneurship you want to break? Uh, that it's all about the money. Okay. Um, at, at the end of the day, I think everybody who's an entrepreneur and writers are. It's been it's been said they're the ultimate entrepreneur because we we not only make and market our own product, we, you know, we we imagine our own product. Um, um, at the end of the day, if you're not happy with who you are, what you do, and it's all about the money, then then you suck. I mean, this is all about enjoying your life. What is one change you'd like to see in the world? I would like racial relations to be a little bit calmer. I just okay. I just feel like we're I, I just feel like we don't know each other, and you put people together at the same time. And they get along, but then also we get very divisive and we become very polarizing. And I don't, I don't think it's, I wish it would go away. What do you want your legacy to be? I want to be known as somebody who gave back. I think that's one of the reasons I coach. Um, it's very, very rewarding to see other people fulfill their dreams. And if in some way I can, I can spark that and that, yeah, it'd be nice to be remembered as somebody who, who helped other people achieve what they wanted to achieve. Where do you find inspiration? Ooh, that's a good point. Um, a lot through reading, uh, a lot through I sp spent a lot of time uh, in, in solitude. I'm not a meditate type guy, but I spent a lot of time just in thought, and and a lot of that involves going out and into the into the wilderness. <laughs> sounds sounds very Christ like, but literally going out and going for a run or going for for a long hike and just letting the cares slip away and letting nature <clears throat> kind of wash over me. Now, I may be misinterpreting the things I've read you that you've written on your website and in your book. Uh, faith seems to be an important part of your journey. What does faith mean to you? Well, <clears throat> you know, it's that's such a loaded question. But I mean, I, I am a Christian, and when people hear that word, people tend to just jump back because you know the, the evangelical movement can be such a polarizing movement because people get so crazy about it. Um, the bottom line is, I'm a man of faith. I I believe in I believe in God. I believe that uh, I believe that we have a purpose here on Earth, and and I try to live my life uh, through through the, the the simple things like being kind to people, being warm to people, giving people benefit of the doubt, and and try not to be a jerk. Now, to me, that's that's about as good as it gets. Love that for sure. What is one book you think every dreamer or entrepreneur should read, and why? I don't know. You know, um, it sounds really weird coming from me, but Harvey Mackay wrote that that book, uh, "Swimming with the Sharks." Okay. Um, that that really impacted me. I read that a long time ago, but that really really had an impact on me as far as believing your dream and um, just getting out there and realizing that if you're going to make it happen, nobody can make it happen for you. You have to do it yourself. How do you define success? Literally, and I hate to sound really hokey about this, but the love of my wife and my children. If I was if I was wealthy, and I have known very wealthy people who are completely miserable, if I was wealthy and my wife didn't talk to me and my kids did not want to hug me or talk to me, then my life would be at a loss. What is one trend you're currently excited about? It's really strange, but it has to do with running. It's it's there's this term called critical velocity running. It's kind of a tempo based training thing. Yeah. And I find I find that the more I weave it into my the training for my team the more they develop a, a strength aspect to go with their speed, and it's been enormously successful. So I know that's that's a geek talking, but that makes me very happy. I love it. I think it's awesome. Uh, what is one habit you find helpful in your life as an entrepreneur? Uh, a routine. It would, without a doubt, the fact that I stick to a routine no matter where in the world I am. Uh, I get up at a certain time. I write during a certain time. I take breaks for fitness and mental restoration at a certain time, and then uh, at the end of the day, when I know that I, I do not write well after 2 p.m., so about 1 o'clock, I kind of wind down. I drive down to the school. I coach my team, and then I kind of just shut down for the night after about 6 o'clock, you know, go to bed about 9.30 or 10, get up in the morning and do it again. You are, uh, in my opinion, with the, the historical books that you write and the other uh, pieces that you've done, you are a master of research. And Well, thank you. Yeah. I think that often we don't know what we're talking about too often when we're presenting what we believe. So for people who are, whether they're a podcaster, whether they're a writer, whether they're a content creator, influencer, or an entrepreneur in another space, what are 
some things that they can do to be better prepared to know what they need to know to show up and perform at the level that they need to. In your case, that's writing. For mine, it's interviewing guests. So how can we be better prepared with the research we do? Well, you know, and that's a really good question because, for instance, when I first started writing books, like I did, I did a book in 2001 about Stanley Livingston in Africa, the, the internet was still pretty much in its infancy and Google was still kind of a new thing. The idea of search engines was still new. Yeah. So, for instance, if I wanted to find out about the, the words that Henry Morton Stanley wrote during his expedition into Africa, I literally had to fly to London. The, you know, this is not hard labor, but then take a train 10 miles outside the city to their to their newspaper library and go to the microfilm and use the microfilm to find, you know, and to have to scan for hours just to find the one article I looked for. And then I would kind of make a print of that and then I would take it all back home and then I would write. Well, and that was always my excuse to go to London. I'd tell my wife, I got, I got to go. I got research to do. <laughs> and, and now I can do all of that in a matter of seconds. And everything is archived. Everything is digitized. And I think that's one of the great mistakes in this age of, you know, exponential levels of information, how little people, how little time people take to really research things before they do anything. And research, you can go down rabbit holes so deep that you will know everything about a subject if you take the time to do it. But I think a lot of people don't do that. And so they go into situations armed with bad information or no information. And in this day of information, that puts you at a loss. Yeah. You know, people know more about you than you know about them, then they're going to win every time. What is one thing you wish you would have known when you started out? No, it's, it's actually one thing I'm glad I didn't know. I didn't okay. know how hard, I didn't know how hard it was going to be. Okay. If somebody had said, all right, this is what's going to happen. You're almost going to lose your house twice because of financial stuff. You're, you're, you're going to have times where you're not going to be able to sell a book for a while, or you're going to be in the middle of a book project that is so overwhelming that you can't sleep at night. Who knows if I would have taken this on? I probably would have just because I'm stupid like that. <laughs> but, but, but at the same time, if somebody had told me when I was a new writer, if they had said, okay, in the next 25 years, here's all the things you're going to get to do. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, what? Oh my, that's, that's an amazing life. I want all those things. And, and, but so that's cool. It's, it's cool that nobody told me that because, but it's, it's great that I got to stumble into those, those things and have those moments in life. If you weren't doing what you're doing today, what do you think you'd be doing? I don't know. I can, I'm, I'm only good at, at writing. <laughs> <That's all. laughs> I, really, I mean, I, I love to coach. I mean, that's, that's, that's number two, but you know, I, I really, all I do well is, is right. And it's, I mean, this is what I was intended to do. And so I'm going to cop out on that one, but that's, that's all I got. What is one dream you're still wanting to fulfill in your own life? I, it's, it involves travel and well, it's a couple of things. It, there are, I'd like to write a great big fiction piece, a big sprawling epic historical novel in, in something where I can really make a story rise up off the page. But, it, but it, to do that, it, I'm, there, there are places I want to go. I want to go to India. I want to go to, to Southeast Asia, these places of the world that I haven't been to, and then thread a narrative arc through the stuff, through the history I learned on those travels uh, into just this big sprawling story. As we wrap up today's episode, we want to leave you have the final thought for the episode. So what's your final thought for our listeners today? It's trite. It's, it's the message that's in, um, it's in my running book and to be a runner, the paperback version. But it's the, it's the thing that I learned from writing about African explorers and the things I learned about writing about other historical figures. It's that theme of keep pushing always. I think very often people quit before, they're, before they get to their ultimate destination just because it gets hard and then when people, when things are hard, people go, oh, that's impossible. Well, nothing's impossible. You know, you just need to keep challenging yourself. You need to keep that, taking that one step forward. And yeah, it's hard. If it, if it wasn't hard, it wouldn't be worth doing, you know, or, or everybody would be doing it. So you just got to keep pushing. Martin, thank you so much for taking time out, telling us about your books, telling us about your career and giving us amazing insights into the world of writing. No, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for having me on. 
Once again, we want to thank Martin Dugard for being on the show today. Make sure to head on over to jumblethink.com where you can find links to Martin and everything he is doing. We also want to thank Opportunity in China for sponsoring today's episode. You can check them out at opportunityinchina.com. We also want to thank our sponsors, Penji, for sponsoring today's episode. You can go check them out at penji.com. Use the code JUMBLE for 15% off your first month. I hope that today's episodes encourage you on the journey of chasing ideas and dreams. If you love today's episode, go on over to wherever you listen to podcasts and tune into more episodes where we have incredible guests and topics to help you turn those dreams and ideas into reality. You can find us on Apple Podcasts simply by going to jumblethink.com slash iTunes and for Spotify, jumblethink.com slash Spotify. Now it's your turn. Get out there, take those dreams and ideas and turn them into reality. Vous êtes une autre personne. Les mères de famille, les enfants peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois. Lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.